lonely, never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, five hundred thousand dollars to in debt. One hundred and ninety-two million dollars. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Hey guys, it's John Warlow. So after five years of hosting Built to Sell Radio, I've distilled the secrets from the most successful founders into the ultimate field guide. The art of selling your business, winning strategies, and secret hacks for exiting on top is now available. The Art of Selling Your Business is a playbook for punching above your weight in a negotiation to sell your company. Now, you may still be years away from selling, but there are actions you can take now that will make your business irresistible to an acquirer in the future. And in this book, you'll get answers to your most vexing questions like, when's the right time to sell? How should I value my business? What are the biggest mistakes owners make when they sell? How do I get multiple offers? How do I attract an offer from an acquirer without looking like I'm desperate to sell? How many companies should I approach? How do I separate real acquirers from tire kickers? When in the process do I reveal my numbers? When and how do I tell my employees? How do I avoid retrading when the buyer drops their price during diligence? And the age old, how do I avoid an earnout? Along with actionable answers to the questions, you'll also get a playbook for defending yourself against the dirty tricks used by the most unscrupulous acquirers, including how to defend yourself against retrading, acquirers who intentionally set unattainable earnout goals, financing an acquirer's business, becoming a prop deal, strategic pacing, competitors posing as acquirers, accepting illiquid or overvalued shares for your business in lieu of cash, and giving away your retained earnings as part of your deal. You'll also get easy to understand definitions of some of the most bewildering terms acquirers use in negotiating to buy your business. Stuff like tipping basket, covenant, downstroke, escrow, indemnification, earnout, Q of E, reps and warranties, churn. I'm just about to throw up just using all this industry lingo, but you'll get a definition for each of them in an easy to understand package. If you order The Art of Selling Your Business today, you'll receive a collection of thank you gifts to enjoy alongside the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. So my next guest, Greg Alexander, built a little 30 employee consulting company. Not a big company, but a pretty successful one, which he sold for $162 million. How do you sell a 30-employee consulting company for $162 million? Well, (laughs) Greg is going to tell you his secrets. And what I think is amazing about this story is he did it all without having to sign on for an arduous earn out. He got 100% of his cash at closing. A couple things he did that he will describe, which are productizing his service, how he got to the point of having a million dollars of fees per employee. He'll talk about how he created a winning corporate culture in a very unorthodox manner. He'll talk about retrading and how that almost sank his deal. And he'll also describe an $80 million mistake he made in building his company. Here to tell you the entire story of his amazing exit is Greg Alexander. Greg Alexander, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. It's great to be here. SBI stands for Sales Benchmark Index. What did you guys do? (laughs) So we were a management consulting company. We specialized in business to business sales effectiveness. Uh, about thirty million in revenue, thirty employees um, when I sold, which was in two thousand. Sorry, thirty employees and thirty million in revenue. You had a million yeah. in revenue per employee. <laughs> yeah, we were clearly uh, a premium provider for sure, and that was part of the business strategy, which I'm sure we'll get into. Wow! So thirty employees, thirty million in revenue. Okay, I got to dig in there. So, okay, first of all, uh, so I am. Xerox. And uh, I want to get more out of the sales guys and gals that I have. I'd hire you guys to do what exactly? 
a whole variety of things. Um, so the, the, the general pitch was this. A big company like Xerox, they have thousands of salespeople. Somewhere between 10 and 25% of their top line revenue is invested in the sales force. So even small marginal improvements in the effectiveness of the sales force, which was typically, typically measured in revenue per sales head, made a huge impact uh, to the business line. So the type of work that we got that we got involved in is determining um, which accounts to pursue, how to pursue them, how many salespeople to hire, uh, what type of salespeople to hire, where to deploy them in terms of sales territories, uh, how to set their quotas, how to write their incentive compensation plans. There was a whole basket of things that we did to improve the productivity of the sales force. Got it. And so how did you bill for your services? Was this project-based time and materials? Like what was the revenue model? Yeah, 100% fixed bid by design. Fixed bid. What does that mean, fixed bid? So there was no uh, charging um, on billable hours. So customer would come to us and we said, we will do X for you. And they paid us a flat rate. Who did you compete with? We can, well, the structure of the industry was there were the big guys at the top. So most commonly, Bain, McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group. Then there were the mom and pops. And in this industry, the sales effect in this industry, it's a cottage industry. There's tons. Every, every sales manager who gets fired yeah. is a sales effect of this yeah. trainer. <laughs> exactly. And then in the middle, there were some boutiques. So there was us. Uh, there was a company called ZS Associates. Uh, there was a, a company called um, the Alexander Group. Ironically, no relation. And where we positioned ourselves, and, and I think this is the reason why we had such great revenue per sales head was just below the McKinsey's, but above the other boutiques. So we were the premium boutique. Got it. And what was the magic behind getting to a million dollars of revenue per employee? I mean, that's because, because I get, I got to understand the, the sort of structure because in most consultancies, you've got the, the kind of partner engagement manager, you know, a bunch of associates, the classic Christmas tree, and there's a lot of headcount rolling up to a partner's sort of salary. So what was your structure from a, from a headcount perspective? Yeah, we didn't have any of that. So, and again, by design. So there, the, the labor market, if you think about it like you would any market, in the area of sales is highly inefficient. And what I mean by that is I could hire a VP of sales from one company. And that company that that VP of sales is working for thought that that person was worth, I don't know, $250,000 and, you know, based on 20 years of experience and maybe some stock options. They really had no idea what that person was worth because that person was probably working, say, 60 hours a week, 48 hours a year, just for easy math, call it 3,000 hours. So on an hourly basis, the employee was getting killed. I mean, he, he could have, he was better off working at McDonald's. I mean, basically no lie. So I was able to take that employee who was extremely capable and just because the market was inefficient, take him out of that position. And instead of making him or her uh, captive to a single company, I made him or her now have the ability to serve a dozen people. And because we were so efficient as to the way we did everything, we productized all our services you know, his output or his value to those businesses was equal to, but then times 12. In other words, he was delivering equal value to 12 companies as he was to one company. And as a result of that, I was able to bill for it. You mentioned productizing. In what way do you, did you productize the business of sales consulting? Yeah, so we, we never sold any one-off projects. You know, we, we were very tight as to where we were going to play and how we were going to win. And every service that we had had a procedural manual, literally step by step. So when I was scoping a project, I knew exactly, you know, what my level of effort was going to be to deliver the work. And therefore I knew exactly what my cost was. So I could sell something for a thousand dollars an hour and deliver for ten for a hundred dollars an hour and pocket the spread. That's what I mean about productizing the service. And our our industry competitors, they didn't do it that way. You know, they, they had very much a classic structure, as you mentioned, the pyramid, partner, engagement manager, associates. And their model was very time-based. It wasn't value-based. Our, our model was value-based. And, and that was a real big distinction for us. And that's what allowed us to get that revenue per head number that I mentioned to you. I think it helped listeners if we just took one of those 
products, those service offerings that you productized. So can you give me an example? Was there like a, a specific product that was a good seller? Sure. Let's take uh, segmentation analysis. So what would happen a lot is a, a big consultancy would get hired to segment a market. And they would say, I don't know, Mr. Software Company, you guys should sell to mid-sized financial services firms in the United States. And then they would hand that over. And it was usually handed over to the executive team, the product team. And they'd say, okay, so this is part of our strategy. But then it would go to the sales reps. And what would the sales reps do with that? They can't call in a market. They have to call in an account and they have to call in a buyer. So we would take this market segmentation. We'd take it all the way down to the account level. And then within an account, we would identify the buyers and the users and the influencers that would be involved in the purchase decision. And it was, it was largely a analytic exercise. Uh, it was, you know, softwares, uh, analytic tools. It was uh, spreadsheets, algorithms, things of that nature. And the way to do the work was the same every time. You did it, you know, if you did it for company A, you could do it for company B, you could do it for company Z. So when we would sell that work in such a way with a standard set of deliverables so that when we won the business, I could hand it to a delivery team and do it extremely efficiently. We were joking earlier about every, you know, washed up, fired sales manager becomes a sales efficiency coach. But I would be curious to know how you convinced, first of all, where did you get your customer facing people, the people that interacted with your customers, where did you recruit them from? Directly from the target companies. So I would, we would pick up the phone and I'd call the head of sales and I'd say, listen, you've been doing this for 25 years. You've had 12 jobs. Every two years you lose your job because every two years, everybody, when the sales numbers are off, they blame you. They forget that, you know, their pricing wasn't competitive or they were trying to sell a bad product or they weren't competitively positioned against it. It was always the sales guy's fault. So most of these sales leaders, although not all of them, but most of them were very talented people. They just were put in a situation where they couldn't succeed. You know, I, I would tell you that most CEOs really don't understand sales effectiveness, you know, at its core. So when the sales number was off, they just thought it was a people problem. And very often it wasn't a people problem. It was kind of an environmental problem. So I would go to that head of sales and acknowledge what his skills were and say, I can take you out of that miserable existence. And it was miserable. And I could put him into my uh, environment and let him truly uh, be successful because we eliminated those environmental factors. How did you do that without undermining your relationship with the company? Well, I didn't hire from my clients. Remember, so we were... Yeah, I hired, I mean, there's 11,000 B2B companies in the world and we might do, I don't know, 30, 40 projects a year. So the, the, there was plenty of people to hire for sure. Got it. That's helpful. That's helpful. And how did you retain them? Because I would imagine the temptation from time to time was like, why do I got to, you know, give all this extra money to Greg when, I mean, I've got this skill set. I'm a 25 year veteran. I, I can do all this consulting stuff. I don't need the umbrella of SBI anymore. How did you retain these guys? We had, we had an incredible ability of bringing in clients. So we had a few people who left our firm and tried to start their own firm, but they just couldn't bring in the clients like we could. You know, we drank our own champagne. We taught our clients how to sell and how to improve the effectiveness of, the, of their sales force. And many often, many, many of the times, we demoed our capability during the sales campaign of, you know, in pursuing them as a client. So, you know, if you quit SBI or some other company, you hang your own shingle, you know, you got to go generate your own clients. And, and we, we were a machine at that. That was number one. And number two, I, I paid everybody more than what the market rate was all the time. And I paid for performance. And because they delivered, you know, outstanding performance as evidenced by that revenue per head figure, you know, between the amount of money they can make with me and the steady stream of clients that I could bring them, we really didn't have a retention problem. The turnover rate in consulting in general is about 30, 40%, depending on the sector. We ran at less than 10. Hmm. Fantastic. So who's the we, like who owned SBI? 
Yeah. So I was the founder of the company. I started in 2006 and I started it. Actually, I should say I was a co-founder. I started it started with a classmate of mine. Um, we came up with the idea together while we were getting our MBA at Georgia Tech. And then we launched the firm. And then about a year into it, we brought another a guy that I used to work with in a previous life. We brought him on board. And that was those three people were kind of the nucleus. And we didn't we weren't aware of it at the time, um, but we were very much following the model that you read about in things like EOS, where you had the, the visionary and the integrator. And the way that we did it is, is I was the visionary and the guy that brought in the work in the beginning. Then we had one individual who was excellent at delivering the projects. And then we, we had one individual who was dedicated to productizing, you know, our work so we could scale. And then as the business grew, um, you know, we, we, we almost stumbled into being organizer functionally you know, around those three major functions. So that's how it evolved. And how did the capital structure evolve over time? Did, did you start to bring in additional partners or was it the three of you guys to the end? Yeah, so my co-founder and I cut up the pie in the beginning. Um, I, I would love to tell you there was a lot of science behind it, but there really wasn't. Um, but we were happy with it. Then when we brought the- Just 50-50 30... down the middle? Did you no, guys put the capital in or- higher. It was 75, 25, 75, uh, myself, 25, him. How come uh, he got so much less? He was uh, much younger. Um, he wasn't going to contribute to the revenue stream early on. Um, he didn't have any intellectual property. You know, he was, um, but he was somebody I trusted and was very bright and someone who I thought could, could help the firm going forward. And he did. I mean, he was, he was outstanding. Then we brought a third partner on, um, fairly early and inside of the first year. And he was a gentleman that I had worked with at my previous spot at uh, EMC. And uh, I cut him in for 24 and a half percent. So I told those guys that I wasn't willing to go below 51% because I wanted to have control. And that if we were to add any other partners in the future, it would have to be out of their end. And we all were okay with that. You know, as years went on, um, we did add additional partners. Uh, we made everybody buy into the partnership. So the, the firm was worth something at that point. And uh, they structured a, a mechanism to allow the firm to be valued and allow them to buy into the firm. And then as the firm got really big, um, they were able to kind of finance the acquisition of some of these junior partners through things like deferred compensation, et cetera. So that's how we did it. You just, you just went way past my pay grade. So you got to slow down for me here. So, okay. So if I think about the, um, th the fact that you were allowing people to buy into the company, what was the valuation methodology you used to value the company as a going concern? Was yeah. it multiple of EBITDA or what was it? So in the spirit of don't do this, you know, here's the first don't do this. So first off, as I just mentioned, I diluted myself 49% inside of the first 12 months. That was an $80 million mistake. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, I mean, we sold the firm for a little over 160 million at exit. And I gave up 49% within the first year. Now, the people that I gave that money up to, were they worth it? Yes, no doubt. Did they contribute to the firm? 100%. Did they contribute $80 million? Not a chance, right? So if I was to do it over again, you know, I, I absolutely positively would, you know, advise having equity partners, but I'd be very, very careful as to how much equity you give up soon. And in my new businesses now, I don't do it like that at all, you know? So still, I, I put my hand on the stove, I burned my hand, and, and now I'm not doing that anymore. Um, so when we valued the firm in the beginning, there was nothing to value. I mean, literally, it was just, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we wrote this very crude operating agreement, and that's how we governed ourselves. Then the firm started becoming worth something. So we uh, developed a formula based on trailing 12 months revenue, which was also an incredible mistake. Uh, Why? Because it was crazy. I mean, we were, we were so profitable, yet we were valuing ourselves in a multiple of revenue. The going rate in the industry was 1.25 but yet, I mean, so the people that bought in early, they got the deal of the century. So let's just, let's just break that down. So the trailing 12 months, you were valuing the company at 1.25 revenue. Yeah. And it, it was like, what kind of profit margin would you, would you make in a typical year? 52% EBITDA margins. Wow. 
And so on a multiple of EBITDA, what did you think it was worth? Yeah, I mean, we sold it, uh, it just under 11 times EBITDA. You know, and I, I mentioned we had $30 million in, in revenue. So 1.25, I mean, what is that? 40 million bucks. So, I mean, we undervalued the firm by almost 400%. Got it. So for folks following along at home, the, the sale price was 162 million. The revenue was 30 million. So if you were valuing it at 1.25 yeah. times 30 million, it would have been about 40 million bucks. Yeah. Right. If you were valuing it at 11 times 500 or uh, $15 million, it would have been roughly 160 million bucks. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Got it. Got it. You know, but these things are all, you know, what it could have should have, you know, I mean, do we have any idea? that the valuations were going to be what they were when we sold. No. I mean, the multiple expansion in our space was enormous. When we started in the business, there was no institutional money. So private equity groups, private lenders, nobody was investing in people-driven businesses for, for all the reasons we know, you know, no assets, et cetera. You know, so then here we are in 2017, about half of our client roster is made up of the world's best private equity firms. They had an incredible appreciation for what we did for them and their portfolio companies. And they had so much money. They had raised so much money. They needed to put it to work. So they started doing deals in asset classes that they historically had never done before. So they started investing in consulting companies. So the supply and demand equation got out of whack, right? There was a ton of money chasing a few deals. So all of a sudden we could, you know, when we went out to market and we hired a banker and ran an auction, the whole thing, you know, once everybody started competing with each other, you know, the price kept going up, 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 and up. When we started the firm in 2006, that was before the financial crisis of 08 and 09. There's no way the firm was worth that. So, you know, the, the guys and gals that come on your show and they, and they say, you know, here's what I did. What I wish they all would start with is a, luck has a huge part of it. There's no question about it, right? So I'm the luckiest guy you've ever met in your life. Now, I made the most of my lucky breaks, thank God. However, luck played a huge role in this and it plays a huge, huge role for everybody. Yeah, we'll get to that for sure. So let's just go back to the math here. So the second part of what I was trying to dig into was as it relates to the new people coming on, you mentioned the two partners, the minority stakeholders that collectively had 48 and a half, 49 and a half percent. When new partners came on, did, did they have to effectively sell some of their shares or did you sell some of your shares? The agreement we had, the reason why I said, listen, I'll give you guys each 24.5% right now if you agree to the fact that this is it. If we bring on future partners down the road, it's coming out of your end, not out of my end, and they were fine with that. So when we added partners, which, by the way, I should mention, we didn't add a lot. We added one absolutely essential employee who is now the CEO of the firm and who we could not have done any of this without. And as he proved himself to be a complete rock star, we gave him an opportunity to become an owner. And that structure of that deal was between my two co-founders and him. And he was buying into them, you know, based on this, this model. Then as years went on, um, a few others were added, but not a lot. Like, I, I mean, the grand total is probably less than a half a dozen. Was there uh, tension between you and the original co-founders you saying, come on, guys, we got to share some of the pie here. We got to bring really good quality people on. And them saying, oh, no, that's like 25%. You're throwing it away for. Well, I, I give them a lot of credit. Um, we, we knew the, the, the difference between being a king and getting rich. We had no problem sharing the wealth. And the people that we shared it with earned every dime. And every time we created an opportunity for people, when when they when those people took advantage of that opportunity and made money, we made 10 times that money. So it, it was a win for everybody. When you talk about 52% EBITDA margins, I'm assuming that is before distributions, obviously, to you, your co-founders, and your other shareholders. That's an operating margin before distributions. Is that right? No, it's after distributions. So after you take your salary and your bonuses, you're still earning 52%. Yeah. We were incredibly profitable. For example, we had no offices. <laughs> Today, we're all working from home. I'm talking to you from my home office. Back then, th there was the belief that you weren't a legitimate firm unless you had offices. You know, and if you look at any P&L statement for a services company today, about 10% of their cost is going to rent, or it was before COVID. 
We didn't do any of that stuff. Um, we, we ran incredibly lean. Um, for example, the entire time that I had the business, there was no HR leader. There was no IT department. There was no CFO. I didn't let any overhead creep into the business. My opinion was any dollar that we spent had to directly impact the growth of the firm. If it wasn't going to grow, uh, impact the growth of the firm, we weren't going to spend it. In what way did that compromise your business? Uh, it, it, what, what impact did that have on, on your efficiency as a company, your structure? Zero. Let me push there because I mean, a hundred, like a $30 million company, everybody working from home, weren't, I mean, working with customer data, weren't you exposing yourself to risks on, even on a compliance, a security, you know, all that jazz? In my attitude, I'm a risk taker. My attitude was if something goes wrong, sue me. And let's see what happens in court. I think sometimes a lot of people get nervous about problems before they actually happen. Also, keep in mind, the way the consulting business worked is our consultants left on Sunday night. They came home on Thursday night. They spent all the time on the client site. So, and those are extremely secure situations in, in secure environments. You know, so, so if I was going to tell somebody they're going to travel 80% of the time, and then when they were home, I was going to make them go to an office. I mean, it would have been crazy. Plus, it allowed me to recruit all over the place. I can't tell you how many superstars I was able to hire because I told them they could live wherever they wanted. And, you know, they were living in some godforsaken city because that's where the job was. And then when I told them that I didn't really care, they could live wherever they wanted. I mean, you know, they take our job and they would move and they'd be a hero at home. And, you know, it worked out for everybody. How would you characterize the SBI corporate culture? <laughs> it was very competitive. Um, I would, you know, we were a group of sales leaders you know, who believed in winning and, uh, you know, you're only as good as your, as your last, de your last deal. Let me tell you a little story about that. And you can edit this out if this is uh, violating language rules, but every Friday we had a contest called the fuck up contest. And what the fuck up contest was, is the person who had the biggest fuck up that week got a thousand dollar bonus. And we had a firm wide conference call and the person would get on the phone and would say, here's how dumb I am. This is the mistake that I made. And then everybody would laugh hysterically. And we would say, OK, what did you learn from that mistake, et cetera? And then literally our fuck ups were our heroes. And the culture that that permeated through, and that's one example of many, is that we wanted, to pe we wanted people to swing for the fences. There was, we wanted people taking massive risks. There was no fear whatsoever. In fact, the quickest way to get fired at SBI is if you were playing it safe. So we, we, we ran really hard. We played really hard. I mean, it was a, it was a, a very, uh, what's, I guess, what's the word? Almost a locker room-like type of setting. Hmm. <laughs> Not for everybody. Um, the reason why we had such low turnover is people would go through the interview process with us with, and within five minutes. They would say, I want in, or they would say, don't ever call me again. Like, they knew right away, you know, who was right for us and, and who wasn't right for us. Why? What would you ask that would reveal that? They, they could feel it. I mean, I'll never forget, I had one person tell me, they said, your culture is so, so thick, I could almost cut it with a knife over the telephone. I mean, they could just feel it as to who we were. And it was, it was incredibly numbers driven. You know, opinions didn't matter. You know, if you had a, we, we stole this from somebody, but it was um, uh, something like, in God we trust, all else bring data. You know, if you made a comment, you better be able to back it up. I mean, it was, it was, it was that type of environment. And, you know, and that, that worked for us. I mean, that led to our uh, outstanding success. I will say that, you know, after we, after I left, um, the world changed and they, they did so well that they sold again which I want to make sure we talk about that because I think the thing that I'm most proud of about our company and maybe even myself personally is how well the business did after the founders left. Cause I think so often the founders leave and the business go in the tank, but just the opposite happened. The founders left and it perpetuated itself. But, but when they went through the process to sell again, there were all these questions like diversity questions and, you know, and proper compliance questions. So I do think when you get to a certain size and you're dealing with a certain type of buyer, Maybe the culture needs to change. But in the early days, when I was there, it was a wild, wild west. Sounds like it. Okay. So let's get into the sale itself. So why, why did you want to sell? I mean, you got this great I culture. 
I didn't want to sell. So here's what happened. <laughs> this is a funny story. So I was grow, 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 grow. I mean, I, I literally would have ran over my grandmother to grow an extra 5% per year. <laughs> and part of our growth strategy as we started to throw off all this money was to start doing some acquisitions. And we noticed that a bunch of money was being spent by clients in product management, particularly in software. Software was a big vertical industry for us. And there was this company at the time called the uh, Pragmatic Marketing. And they had this consulting slash training product that was really incredible. And they, they, they pretty much owned the product management office and software and the product management budget. Any type of discretionary dollar that was spent there to improve operations went to them. So and the, the founder of Pragmatic Marketing, whose name is escaping me right now, hired an investment banking firm called MHT. And they brought the deal to us. And they said, hey, this would be a natural extension for you guys and my co-founders and I were like, yeah, it would. And we bid on it. <laughs> we submitted, I think it was like a $22 million bid and they sold for like 80 mil. Our, our bid was comical. And after the, after we lost, I went and had a drink with the banker. His name was Alex Six. And I said, why did we lose? And he told me, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, if you can get $80 million for that business, what could you get for mine? And he said, well, let's find out. So I left that meeting. I went back to my partners and I said, listen, I think we should float a trial balloon out there. See what, see what we might fetch. I had zero intentions of selling. I mean, I put my hand in the Bible on this. I had no idea what it was worth. And at, at that time, because I was no longer selling or delivering work, the guys that were in the business, they said, you're right, Greg, we should. Because a, a big part of our client roster was private equity firms. And they were getting asked all the time, hey, if you guys ever go out to market, let us know. We'd like to make a bid. And I said, all right, well, let's give it a try. And we and that firm... MHT, which is now, I think they say it, they pronounce it Cowan, C-O-W-E-N, or Cohen. Um, we called them up and we hired them and and they ran the process. And I, I was fully expecting it not to materialize. I was curious as to what we would learn. I valued going through the process and having somebody kick the tires on our business because you know I had never been through due diligence before. And I'm sure that strategically I had all kinds of holes in my business. And I wanted them to point that out to me so that we could use that as strategic input and get better. But then the numbers started coming and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I couldn't believe it. So that, that's how it happened. I mean, honestly, like I, I, I thought I was gonna die in that place. I used to, we would have a company event every year. We called it the Ideal Life Conference. I'll tell you about that in a moment. I used to tell people that my partner was gonna do my eulogy. They said, when are you gonna exit? I said, when I go in the coffin, I'll be 85 years old, they'll put me underground. <laughs> And, and Aaron Bartels is going to sit over here and give my eulogy. And in the church, is going to be 500 of you. Like, I thought that was my exit plan. But then the world went nuts. I mean, the valuations out there are that right now, even now, are crazy. So that, 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 that's how it happened. You mentioned the Ideal Life Conference. What's that? Yeah. So we had every employee uh, go through an exercise called the Ideal Life Exercise. And it was a 360-degree view of their life. Where do you want to live? What kind of work do you want to do? Uh, what type of guy or gal you want to marry? How much money you want to make? What kind of food you want to eat? What music do you listen to? I mean, it was really, it was, it was comprehensive. And it, and it represented perfection. And we said, okay, so that's the perfect life you, life you want to live. How close to or far away are you from that now? And almost inevitably, it was like, I'm, I'm a long way away. I'm like, okay, so is work helping you? In that instance, getting you to living your perfect life, or is it hurting you? And almost every time it was like, yeah, work's a major problem. And we said, okay, well, how do we turn work, us or the people we were recruiting you from, from a problem to an opportunity? How do we design your job in such a way that we help you get to your ideal life? And they would tell us, and we would design their jobs that way. Now, could we get there every time? No. Could we get 80% of, of the way most of the time? Yeah. So everybody had this thing called the ideal life. And then this great book came out from the founder of uh, LinkedIn. It was called the, the Alliance. And they, they turned it into a military construct called the tour of duty. So we took everybody's ideal life and we put a three-year window on it called the tour of duty. And when we made our numbers every year, we went to these big exotic places, resorts in Mexico and all over the place. And we had a big boondoggle and we celebrated the uh, ideal life. And we allowed everybody to bring their spouse and it was a big party. It was awesome. We had some incredible times. Those were glorious days. 
That's awesome. Okay. So let's get into a little bit more on the deal itself. So you have this trial balloon. To go back to pragmatic marketing, you offered 22. I'm assuming you were using the kind of one, one, one and a quarter times top line revenue to come up with that. It was. Yeah. So we had in our head this antiquated way of looking at things. And that's when we first learned about that these businesses were trading off of multiples of EBITDA which in our world was phenomenal because all, all consulting businesses are hugely cash flow positive because there's very little cost to run the business. So that was a big, big change. And then, you know, the, the lenders started lending into these deals, which changed everything. In what way? Well, so for example, so when we got together and decided to go to market, the banker that we hired, which we hired MHG, a guy by the name of Sean Terry, who's now over Cowan. If anyone's looking for a banker, he's, the Michael Jordan of investment bankers. <laughs> he goes, he said, listen, he said, Greg, you're an interesting guy. He goes, here's my fear. If I take you on as a client, because these guys work, you know, for commission, we're going to get to the 11th hour and you're, you're not going to be closable. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, someone's going to put a deal on the table. Everyone's going to stack hands. You're going to keep asking for more and more and more and more. And he was right. I was never going to be satisfied. And he goes, I need you to tell me. The terms. This this is the first time. This is how inexperienced I was. Terms are more important than price. I mean, all day, every day. You, you talk about that in your book. What are the terms that you'll do a deal? And I said, okay, here are the terms. I want no earn out. I'm not rolling any, any equity. I want all the cash up front. I want to leave the day of the closing. And I want my restricted covenant agreement not to exceed three years. Because I knew, I knew what I wanted to go do next. I had a vision for my future, which I'm not doing with my new company, which I'll tell you about at the end of this interview. And I said, there it is. And then he said, I'm not going to be able to pull that off. And I said, great, I'll go find someone who will. And he goes, no, 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 let me give it a shot. And sure as shit, he pulled it off. So that, those were the terms. And, the, and those were the, um, the, uh, the reasons why I eventually ended up agreeing to the deal. There's a lot of real estate theory that would suggest that you should never actually give your bottom line to your real estate agent when you're selling your home, because they're going to basically use that information against you. Effectively, they're going to basically make sure you get that, but not a penny more. What, what, was, the, what was the risk in telling your investment banker that you wanted all those terms? Did, did you risk... Uh, anything in, in laying it out for them before you went to market? Understand that when I was doing this, I had no idea what I was doing. Literally no clue. So in hindsight, I look back at that now and say, Greg, you were foolish. So in many ways, I guess I'm a cautionary tale. In what way do you think you were foolish? I shouldn't have told them what my terms were. Why? For the, for the real estate theory that you just talked about, that he would have managed to those terms. I should have kept my mouth shut. However, you know, I mean, I don't know if you look at it now, it worked out for me pretty well. So I, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm glad to do it. Here's the thing that, that's unique about my story. I think I didn't think we were going to sell. I literally had no intentions of selling it. But Greg, there's got to be a risk in that, right? Like taking your business to market, you've got this cash cow, 52% profit margins. I mean, you are absolutely killing it. To take it to market risks telling everybody in the world all the inside secrets of what you're doing, including your profit margin. Like, how did you, like, weren't you worried that you were basically opening your Komodo to all your competitors? No, I actually wanted that. I viewed this as a marketing exercise, right? So I told them because we were doing so much business with private equity firms, and yet there were thousands of private equity firms didn't even know who we were. So I said to them, listen, I want you to show up this sucker to everybody because it was a way for me to get in front of all these people. And I, and I had a feeling that these people would look at our business and they would say, we're not going to buy you. And then I would follow that up with, great, let's talk about your portfolio companies because it's a consulting gig I want to sell you. <laughs> Literally, that was, that was the thinking. And then as it relates to my competitors, my competitors, listen, I, I, I firmly believe this. Execution trumps all. You can look at all my financials and my margins and my strategy and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, when we get in a street fight, who's going to win? And it's going to be me. I'm going to out hustle you. So I didn't care about all that stuff. There's nothing proprietary in the consulting world. There really isn't. I mean, we can all go read the same things. We can go pitch the same stuff to clients and we can, and we can all figure it out. It's not like I'm, I'm splitting the atom here. There's no intellectual property, so to speak, you know, that's going to you know, turn me into the next Google. So I wasn't really worried about all that stuff. And I also wanted to go steal my competitors' employees. So they started shopping this stuff to my competitors. 
and they started looking at us and they bumped into things like the ideal life. Maybe they, maybe they want to come to work for me. I had this, um, I had this hilarious dinner with Accenture, which those guys are clowns. I mean, there's 505,000 of them now, but my God, this BD guy, this corporate development guy, he flies here to Dallas and takes me out to this fancy dinner at this place called the mansion and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And he was telling me how great, how great I was going to love it there. And, and all the perks that you get as a partner at Accenture. I'm like, dude, I mean, not to be arrogant here, but I'm, I'm making more than Tony Romo, who was the starting quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys at the time. <laughs> I'm like, I really don't care about your partner perks. And it was, it was, it was comical. So I, I didn't care about any of that stuff. I was reckless with all that. I knew the growth of the firm and their the sales benchmark index is still in existence. They are the best in the world of what they do. They're growing like a weed. They're going to be a billion dollar company someday. The opportunity in front of them was so great. The, the risk was extremely low in this scenario. Awesome. So let's get into the actual deal. So you shop the deal almost on a lark. It sounds like a, and, and sure enough, you get offers. What, how many offers did you get? You know, you'd have to ask my uh, co-founders that because they ran the process, which I think is an, an important distinction here. And I got to give the bankers all the credit in the world. When I gave them the terms, the most important one was that, that I wasn't going to stick around and, and under any conditions. They completely removed me from the process. They told me, listen, you cannot communicate with any of the buyers at all. Because if you do, they're going to want you to be involved after the deal. And I wasn't even willing to like sign a consulting agreement or anything. I was ready to move on. So all of that stuff, I mean, I, I literally was transparent. Now I started hearing the stats, you know, they, they reached out to X number of firms and then there was X percentage of interest. And then it got down to like, uh, what's the word there? Uh, indication of interest. I think it's called. Well, there's um, a letter of intent and an IOI indication of interest. Yeah. 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 And then there was like a dozen of those guys. And then there was a fewer of them that did management meetings. And there was this whole waterfall process. And I know that's important to your audience, but you know, I also know what I can, what I'm, what I can share and what I can't, I'm not an expert in that. I, I didn't run that process. The guys that were going to stay after the sale, they ran the whole thing rightfully so because they were deciding who to get in bed with. And they wanted to drive that whole thing. So I, I, I literally never met the buyers. I uh, didn't sit in any meetings, didn't review any documents, didn't negotiate any terms, nothing. So when you got to the IOI stage, what was your reaction to the offers you were getting at that point? Well, my reaction at home to my wife was, holy shit, can you believe this? <laughs> Honestly, you know, and, and she was there from the beginning. I mean, I started this business from my kitchen table in my boxer shorts with no employees, no company, no customers. I had made some money in my life because I was an early employee, employee at a tech company and we did really well. I pushed all the chips into this business. So like the two of us were like, like this was a life changing thing. I, I like to tell people I'm a short fat kid from Peabody, Massachusetts. <laughs> there's, there's nothing special about me. Right. And we couldn't believe it. now what I told them of course, was very different. You know, hey, maybe we're worth more and, you know, they're not getting this piece of our value proposition and then they're, they're missing this growth opportunity that's in front of us, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I knew I had, and again, this was by accident because I, I, I've read your books, which are excellent, by the way, and I've read others in your category and they talk about making sure that you know why you're selling before you're selling. And I will tell you, I knew that. I, I was crystal clear on the fact that this was a great 11 year journey, it was over for me. I wanted to close the chapter. There was a new part of my life. It, I, when I sold, I was 47 years old. I knew what I wanted to go do next. I was definitely going towards something as opposed to running away from something. So I looked at it through the lens of, will this sale fund what I want to go do next? That was it. And the answer was yes. And I will tell you that um, when the business got soft, or actually, I, I haven't mentioned that. As we were going through, it took us nine months to sell the business. In like month seven, because all of my partners were completely absorbed and distracted by what we were going through, the business got soft. What do you and, mean the business got soft? What does that mean for folks who don't understand that term? So the revenue number started coming down. Like we were, we grew, we grew at like thirty percent a year for like ten years or something like that. 
And next thing you know, we, we were going to like 17% or 20%, something like, and, and that spooked, you know, the, the guys that were doing the spreadsheets and, and they were valuing the business on, you know, estimated future cash flow. And they were using that discounted cash flow analysis to do that. You know, they had to redo their models and they came back and, and retraded the LOI, um, you know, based on that softness. What do you mean by retrading the LOI? So they, in the LOI, there was purchase price and there were terms and then the business got soft. And, and by the way, this is the other thing the banker did great. When the business started soften, softening a little bit, the, uh, there was a group of people that were interested in buying the firm and they started falling away left and right because they got, they got spooked about the business. Because our business, there was no recurring revenue. It was all project-based, et cetera. So you know, there was, I started wondering whether or not it was going to happen. And my banker kept saying, it only takes one, it only takes one, it only takes one. <laughs> and he was right. Um, so they came, they lowered their number. They came back and they lowered their number. But it was still a number that far exceeded what I wanted for it. You know, John, one thing I've learned from you and, uh, and listening to all the work that you've done is there's a difference between what the business is worth and what the business is worth to you. And this is a really important lesson. And even with the lower number that they offered us, it was a, they were paying me a lot more than what the business was worth to me. So I agreed to sell it. What was the difference between the original LOI and the retraded amount? I think it was like 10 million bucks. I, 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 I'm, and I'm not avoiding the question. I honestly don't remember it. it. That was about right. It was in the $10 million range. And it caused a little bit of a, it caused a little friction because um, when my partners and I agreed on how this was going to go and who was going to get what, my co-founder was going to get some cash at closing based on the original deal. And then the deal got retraded, so to speak, and the cash at closing got reduced. So I went to him and I said, hey, I said, I'm only going to do this if, if now I'm getting all the cash at closing and you're not. You're signing up for the next bite at the apple. Are you okay with that? And he was because he believed in the next bite of the apple. So then the deal closed and he didn't get any cash at closing. About a year later, you know, he, he got amnesia and he was kind of upset with that and said, you know, if I knew then what I know now, I don't think I was treated fairly, which was a real shame because it, it fractured our relationship. As, as luck would have it, a couple of years after that, they sold again. And he ended up making a ton of money. So he was very wise in doing what he did because he probably made more that way than he would have my way. So in the end, I'm very glad that it worked out for everybody. Um, but that did happen, you know, and that was, that was a moment of great stress right there at the 11th hour. It was stressful because what, what, what was the most stressful part? Because it sounds like your partner was capitulated easily and said, yeah, sure. I, I don't mind taking, you know, rolling my equity effectively. What, what, what made it so stressful? Because it was less money. You know, and, and at that point in time, we had had a number in our head and we were, I was kind of emotionally committed to a certain number and it was, it was less money. And it, it kind of rattled me a little bit like, oh, you know, maybe I should wait a year. Maybe I should wait two years. Uh, you know, and in the end, too, if I waited, I, I probably would have made more money. But, you know, I got some great advice at that time that you really can't time the market. And I forget who it was, but somebody said to me, best time to sell your business is when somebody wants to buy it. And, uh, you know, I ended up taking that advice, but it was, that was stressful at that, at that time. Did it, did it make you question the morals of the other side? Hey, we had a deal. We had a commitment. We had a, we shook hands on a number and now you're trying to retrade on it. Did you emotionally get sucked into that? No, they were right. You know, our, our growth rate came down. So the math said that they should offer less. They were, they were correct. I was, I was pissed that our, that our business got soft at exactly the wrong time. Pissed at who? At, at us as the company, you know, we, we let the distraction of selling the business impact the business results. Um, and that, that's another learning for your audience is that, uh, you know, if you're planning on selling your business, my recommendation based on my own experience is I would pick some people in your company who are going to be responsible for selling your company and I would isolate them. And that's all they would do for that year to sell your company and everybody else would be heads down and running the business. And I'd have two teams and we didn't do that. You know, we were, we were all doing two jobs and that distraction was costly. 
Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like it, but it, again, it worked out enormously well for you. I'd be curious to know what the emotional impact has been of selling your company. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in your own words, like a guy in boxer shorts <laughs> starting a business from scratch. Yeah. It sounds like there was some regret uh, with the way it played out with your co-founder at, at least at one point. And there was a period of time there. It, there was no regret on my behalf. There was, um, there were some, um, you know, you want to make somebody upset with you, make them a lot of money. And a, a lot of people made a lot of money and everybody wanted to count everybody else's money. So there, there was some, you know, there, there definitely was some grief there. I, I honestly, and I don't mean to be cold about this at all. I didn't care. I rested my head on the pillow every night, very peacefully, because everything that we set out to do, we did and then some, and we changed a lot of people's lives in the process. I mean, there's, there's several millionaires that have, were created from that story, and there's many more to be created as a result of that. So there was no, there was no regret there. The, the other thing that happened to me, you know, in, in kind of lessons learned, the big lesson that I learned is I waited too long. You know, I, I thought that business, SBI, was the finishing line. And what I learned was it was a stepping stone. And, and once I was free of running that business, I was able to pursue my other dreams. And the pursuit of those other dreams emotionally has been incredibly gratifying, way more so than running that business. I, I, I don't think I realized it at the time, but with you know, retrospection now, I, I stayed too long. I, I probably should have sold that firm. I don't know. It took us 11 years. Maybe I should have sold that business in year six or year seven. And had you done that, you would have left many, many, many millions of financial wealth on the table. I know. You know Seems what's like interesting about that? <laughs> I, I drive a 2009 Cadillac. My wife drives a 2008 Jeep. We live in a nice home, but not anything extravagant. Um, when, I, when I got my windfall, I, I thought I was going to buy all these toys and do all this stuff. And really, I, I did two things. <laughs> First, I made a large donation to a Catholic charity that uh, was very important to one of my co-founders. He was battling cancer, and I, and I wanted to do something for him. And he's such an unselfish person that when I asked him if I could do something for him, he directed me to the Catholic church and I made a donation there. And then I founded my family office. I put all the money into that. It's called Capital 54. And it invests in guys like me back then and invests in owners of boutique professional services firms. And we now have this community um, of members in this company called Collective 54. It's kind of like an EO for professional services. And uh, we're investing in them and then we're helping them. And it's, uh, it's so incredibly rewarding to help other entrepreneurs do what I did. And uh, that, that, that is, that, that's the thing I splurged on, which is crazy, you know, but I mean, I mean, how many steaks can you eat? You know, how many trips can you make? And it's like, you know, maybe if I was older, I don't know, because I, I sold the 47, maybe if I was 65 or something, it would have been differently, but I was still so young and so, so into it that, uh, you know, really, really pay attention to that. The, the listener should learn from my experience and, and really understand that whatever you're working on right now, it's not the finish line. It's a stepping stone. Well said. Where can people find out about Collective 54, uh, the book? Give us give some websites there where people can, can find yeah, yeah. you. So, so, so here's my pitch. So collective54.com forward slash insights is our podcast. So my assumption is anyone who's listening to this likes podcast, check that one out. Um, there's also a book called The Boutique, How to Start, Scale, and Sell a Professional Services Firm, which you can find on Amazon. And that is, uh, that's a community for owners of professional services firms, like an EO for just that one industry. That's number one. Number two, our family office, which is our investment vehicle, vehicle is called capital54.com. So sometimes we're on the other side now where we're buying firms and making investments. So if you're someone who wants to sell all or a piece of your firm, reach out to us. Those are, those are the two main areas that I would direct people towards. Awesome. 
And I'm assuming you're active on LinkedIn as well. Greg Alexander will put your profile in the, uh, in the show notes. Greg, I appreciate your candor and story. It's amazing. And I'm grateful for you sharing with us. Well, hey, listen, I, I want to say I want to thank you for doing what you're doing. The body of work you've built up is enormous. I also want to thank the other guests that have been on the show because, you know, these businesses, mine and, and, and others, they're all small private businesses. It's really hard to get this information out there. And I think you're at like 300 shows now. So, I mean, it's, it's a really unique asset. So, a big shout out to all your previous guests. Anyone who's listening to this and wondering if they should be a guest, get over yourself and do it. To, you know, <laughs> it it's gone huge, huge kudos for you for kind of being the, um, you know, the ringleader of all this. Oh, uh, you're very, you're very kind of D Greg. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.